Yubel versus Adrian. Adrian has just sacrificed the one he loves to acquire a full-powered Exodia deck. His plan? To create a world free of suffering. To achieve that goal, he needs to first go through Yubel. Yubel, however, thinks Adrian's goal is foolish. Since to her, a world without the one you love is pointless. And of course, to Yubel, to suffer for the one you love is the true meaning of love. Spoilers, in the end, Adrian, despite being one draw away from getting the Exodia insta win several times throughout the duel, is thwarted at the last minute and then defeated by the Yubel possessed Jesse. However, that begs the question, did Adrian have any chances in this duel to secure the win? Or perhaps was his fate sealed and Yubel was always going to achieve victory? We won't know unless we jump into the duel. The duel begins and Jesse Yubel goes first. He draws and his opening hand consists of Herman, Lord of Striking Thunder, Triangle Force, Hand Destruction, Dual Gate, and two copies of Delta Barrier. Jesse starts by activating his continuous spell Triangle Force. Due to its effect, it activates two more copies of itself from the deck. Now, with three continuous spells face up on the field, Jesse sends all of them to the grave in order to special summon his Haman Lord of Striking Thunder. Jesse, knowing that Adrian is playing an Exodia deck, follows this play by activating his Hand Destruction spell. Its effect in the anime differs from the one in the real world, however, its anime effect is each player sends four cards from their hand to the graveyard and then draws four new cards. If a player has less than four, they send their entire hand instead and draw one card for each card sent. If a player has no cards, they simply draw one new card. Since Jesse only has three cards in his hand, he sends his two Delta Barriers to the grave alongside his dual gate in order to draw three new cards. He gets Dimensional Fusion Destruction, Eternal Reverse, and Delta Barrier. Adrian, on the other hand, who had an absolutely cracked starting hand of four pieces of Exodia and the spell Ritual of the Ultimate Forbidden Lord, is forced to send four of these cards to the graveyard. And believe it or not, it is heavily implied that the next card that Adrian was about to draw as soon as his turn started was Exodia the Forbidden One. Which means he would have had all five pieces on his very first turn and would have insta won the game straight away. Do you know the odds of that happening? It's 0.0002% and that is drawing all the pieces going first. I don't know how much it differs going second, but this is old Yu-Gi-Oh where you draw on the first turn. So I assume the percentages are quite similar. All I know is Adrian, I bet you wished you went first now. Anyway, Adrian sends three pieces of Exodia to the graveyard, along with his ritual of the ultimate forbidden lord. He draws four new cards. He gets Exodia the Forbidden One, Fog King, Royal Sword, and Burden of the Mighty. Jesse sets Delta Barrier face down and ends his turn. It's Adrian's turn, and he draws. His opening hand consists of Exodia the Forbidden One, Right Arm of the Forbidden One, Burden of the Mighty, Fog King, Royal Sword, and Crest Burn. Since there are five Forbidden One cards in his hand and grave total, he can activate his Ritual of the Ultimate Forbidden Lord, despite it being in the graveyard. Now, thanks to its effect, he can return all Forbidden One cards in his grave back into the deck. He can then discard two Forbidden One cards in his hand, and after he does, he can special summon Exodius the Ultimate Forbidden Lord from his hand or deck. Now, since there are two Exodia pieces in his grave, this monster gains 1,000 attack for each. And to make sure we are all on the same page, Exodius, the ultimate Forbidden Lord's effect in the anime is, this card cannot be destroyed by battle. This card is unaffected by the effects of spells, traps, and effect monsters controlled by the opponent. Controlled by the opponent. I have emphasized that for a reason. It will come up later. Just keep it in mind. When this card attacks, send one Forbidden One monster from your hand or deck to the graveyard. If there are five different Forbidden One monsters in your graveyard, you win the duel. Let's be honest, if you're sacrificing your girlfriend to get this card, it needs to have all these kinds of protection for your Yu-Gi-Oh to be worth it. Is it worth it? <laughs> 
happy to, I guess so, sure. Adrian activates his Burden of the Mighty Continuous Spell, which reduces the attack of opponent's monsters by 100 times their level. Herman is weakened by this. Adrian attacks it, and due to Exodius's effect, it sends another piece of Exodia to the grave, increasing its own attack. Jesse, not wanting to lose Herman, activates his set, Delta Barrier. Due to this card's effect, Delta Barrier, when it's activated, lets him play any identical cards to itself in the graveyard face up. Very lucky then that he sent the two Delta Barriers in the last turn. Very lucky indeed. With all three face up on the field, its effect activates. It makes the damage from an attack zero and prevents a monster being attacked from being destroyed by battle this turn. No damage is dealt and Herman is not destroyed. Adrian ends his turn. It's Jesse's turn and he draws Uriah, Lord of Searing Flames. He sends his three Delta Barrier continuous traps on the field to the graveyard. This allows him to special summon Uriah, Lord of Searing Flames. Uriah's effect allows it to gain 1,000 attack for each continuous trap in his grave. Burden of the Mighty weakens Uriah. However, Jesse activates his Eternal Reverse Equip spell by attaching it to Uriah. This card lets Jesse, once per turn, target one face-up spell or trap on the field and set it face down. Ubel forces Burden the Mighty face down. He then uses Uriah's effect, which can destroy one set spell or trap per turn. Jesse enters his battle phase and attacks Exodius with Herman. Exodius is not destroyed thanks to its effect. However, the damage is still dealt. Adrian takes the first damage of the duel. Jesse ends his turn. It's back to Adrian, and he draws Break the Seal. Adrian moves straight into his battle phase and attacks Uriah. Another Forbidden One monster is sent to the grave, increasing Exodius' attack. However, not wanting Uriah to go to the grave, Jesse activates the second effect of Eternal Reverse. By sending it to the graveyard, he can prevent the equipped monster from being destroyed by battle. Uriah isn't destroyed, however, Jesse still takes the damage. With only one more attack left until the final piece of Exodia enters his grave and Adrian automatically wins the duel, he ends his turn. Now I'm going to have to jump in here because there's a little bit of misplay that happened, which has really serious ramifications on the rest of the duel. You see, the previous turn, Jesse Ubel fully explained Eternal Reverse's protection effects. So why was Adrian surprised when Uriah wasn't destroyed by the battle? If he wanted to remove a monster from the field, then he should have attacked the Haman. It had no protection. Now, you might be saying, well, he probably just wanted to do the damage. But that doesn't make any sense. Adrian is going for a alternative win condition. All he needs to do is get to his next turn, attack, and he wins. Life points don't matter in this duel, so the most logical thing is to remove a monster from the field. Give your opponent less resources to work with. I know there's no way he can know that Jesse needs all three Sacred Beasts on the field to fuse them all together, but let's be honest, had he done this, had he attacked Haman and removed it from the field, he would have won on his next turn. Jesse wouldn't have been able to deal with Exodius in any way, shape, or form, and Adrian would have 100% won. Oh, and just to clarify, the Break the Seal card that Adrian has in his hand, the reason he didn't set it face down is because he needs two copies of it on the field to use its effect, which lets him add an Exodia piece from his deck to his hand, which obviously would have won the duel for him, but he needs two copies of it for it to work, so that's why he didn't set it face down, just to let you know. And if you wondered why he isn't going into his Fog King and all of his other fog cards in his hand. At the moment, they are not worth putting on the field because he's got his win condition on the field that's indestructible. So I don't think he wants to tribute that just to summon a fog king. And fog king and all the other cards don't really get their best effects until he gets his field spell, fog castle. So no misplays in other aspects there. Anyway, now that we're all on the same page, it's Jesse's turn and he draws Dual Gate. He activates it. Now, by banishing itself and a copy of itself in the grave, he can draw two new cards. He draws Phantom Sky Blaster and Raviel Lord of Phantasms. He summons Sky Blaster. Due to its effect, when it is summoned, it summons a token for every other monster he controls. With Uriah and Herman, two Brigadier tokens are summoned to the field. Jesse then uses the second effect of Phantom Sky Blaster. This allows it to inflict 300 damage for each of the tokens and itself that are on the field. Jesse tributes Phantom Sky Blaster and the two tokens to special summon his final sacred beast, Raviel, Lord of Phantasms. 
Now, believe it or not, Jesse actually has the win on the field right now. He's going to go into a completely different play. And obviously, he's going to win really far down the line. But he could have won right here and right now. Why didn't he? I don't know. How could he have won? Well, like this. With Raviel on the field, he can use its effect, which allows it to tribute two monsters on the field to increase its attack by the combined attack of the tributed monsters until the end of the turn. With a 4,000 attack Haman and a 3,000 attack Uriah, Raviel would have 11,000 attack points. He could just smash straight into Exodius and would have won the duel. Even with just the 4,000 boost from Haman, that's more enough to win the game. The only reason I can think of why he didn't do this is literally just the plot. They want him to get out Armatile because that's the perfect counter to Exodius to beat Adrian's boss monster. So I think that's why. So maybe Jubel Jesse was overconfident. That's the best I can do. But regardless, it's a misplay anyway. So instead of winning this turn, Jesse activates Dimension Fusion Destruction. This card lets him banish the three sacred beasts on his side of the field in order to fusion summon Armatile the Chaos Phantom. This fusion monster can't be destroyed by battle, and it has the effect to inflict 10,000 battle damage to a monster the opponent controls. Now, this damage is like an effect. You have to like target the monster and inflict it upon it. So it has to affect the monster. Unlike the Armatile being boosted 10,000 attack and attacking into the monster, because if he could do that, he could have won. But because its effect states that it's inflicting the damage to a monster, it's an effect affecting it. And obviously, Exodius can't be affected by monster effects. So Jesse Ubel can't win with this effect. However, luckily, Armatile has a third effect. Once per turn, during the main phase, he can switch control of this monster to the opponent's side of the field until the end of the turn. If he does, all other monsters on the field are banished during the end phase. Armatile moves to Adrian's side of the field, Jesse ends his turn, and as he does, Armatile, which is technically Adrian's monster now, banishes all other monsters on the field. Exodius, who is only immune to opponent's effects, is banished. As the end phase fully comes to an end, Armatal returns back to Jesse's side of the field. It's Adrian's turn, and he draws Fog Castle. Adrian seemingly switches strategies here. Now activating his Fog Castle, he plans to go for a different win condition. However, secretly, Fog Castle and all the accompanying Fog cards are actually a part of the Exodia OTK strategy, but shh, Ubel doesn't know that. Let's see what happens. Due to Fog Castle's effect, when a monster Adrian controls would be destroyed, it can be instead moved to a different monster zone. However, the monster zone it previously occupied can no longer be used. When this card leaves Adrian without any usable monster zones, Fog Castle can be sent to the grave along with Adrian's entire hand. He can then add four monsters in his grave back to his hand. However, he cannot conduct his battle phase the turn he uses this effect. I don't know why, but I really want this Fog Castle card to be made into the real world. Fog Castle makes your monster zones like the Castle Spire things, and every time your monster would be destroyed, it moves to another one. That zone is shut off, and that keeps happening until you completely run out of zones, so your monster can't come back to the field, but then you can just add four cards back to the graveyard. I don't know, I just think that's a cool, like, gimmick of you lose the zones by protecting your monster. I don't know, it's, I, I think it's kind of cool. With Fog Castle on the field, Fog King can be normal summoned without any tributes. Fog King is actually kind of insane in the anime since it's basically a walking, talking skill drain. You see, its effect is, while it is face up in the field in attack position, all other monsters on the field have their effects negated. When this card attacks a monster, you can have both this card and the attack target's attack become one during the damage step only. To round out his play, Adrian equips Fog King with his Royal Sword. Royal Sword can only be equipped to Fog King. Now, while equipped, if it battles, one crest counter is placed on this card at the end of the battle phase, with a maximum of four. The equipped monster gains 800 attack for each crest counter on the card. If there are four crest counters on this card, you can send the equipped monster to the graveyard to inflict 4,000 damage to the opponent. So with this, we have a new win condition established. If Fog King can attack or be attacked four times, he can go for game. Fog King attacks Armatile. He activates Fog King's effect to make both monsters' attack points one. 
armor tile is destroyed since its battle protection effect was negated. Fog King would also have been destroyed, however it is instead moved to another monster zone to prevent the destruction. The zone it previously occupied is now unusable. As the battle phase ends, Royal Sword gains one counter, increasing Fog King's attack by 800. Adrian ends his turn. It's Jesse's turn, and he draws another copy of Phantom Skyblaster. He summons it to the field, unable to use its effect since one, he has no other monsters on the field, and two, its effect is negated by Fog King. He goes straight into his battle phase and attacks Fog King. The damage is dealt, however, again before destruction, Adrian uses his Fog Castle to save his monster by moving it into a different monster zone. As the battle phase ends, Royal Sword gains a second counter, increasing Fog King's attack by another 800. Jesse ends his turn. It's Adrian's turn, and he draws a second copy of Break the Seal. Adrian moves straight into his battle phase and attacks and destroys Sky Blaster. At the end of the battle phase, Royal Sword gains a third counter. Adrian sets his Crest Burn and two copies of Break the Seal face down and ends his turn. Adrian is one attack or being attacked away from going for game. How will things pan out? It's Jesse's turn and he draws Akashic Record. He activates it. Due to this card's effect, he can draw two new cards. However, if either of those two cards have been used by Jesse earlier in the duel, then they are banished. Jesse draws Nightmare Shuffle and Grave Squirmer. Neither card has been played earlier in the duel, and as such, both are added to his hand. Akashic Record, I actually really like the idea of this card. I wouldn't mind this made for the real world. However, I guess they could add the, the stipulation that the cards drawn can't be played by either player because there's a lot of things like Ash Blossom, Maxi and things people play nowadays, which would be in both decks. So I guess it'd be a cool little risk reward kind of card, but I guess it would benefit people that like their cards getting banished. So no, 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 I just think it's an interesting card. I don't mind seeing this come to the real world. Uh, I don't know how balanced it would be. Anyway, Jesse activates Nightmare Shuffle. While this card remains face upon the field, Jesse sets one random card in his graveyard face down in the spell and trap zone. During each of his standby phases, he must swap the set card with another random card in his grave. At any point, he can activate the set card by sending Nightmare Shuffle to the grave. If the selected card is legally playable, then that's all there is to it. However, if the card's activation timing is not quite right, say he set a monster face down, a spell card, that's a normal spell, that you can't activate like a quick play spell, which is something I guess he could do if he activates it during the opponent's turn, or it's a card whose criteria can't be activated. Instead, it has a detrimental effect where the card won't be activated since it can't be used, and every card in Jesse's hand and on the field will be sent to the graveyard. Now, this card's effect isn't fully gone into in this episode. It's kind of like brushed past, but I assume that the card that gets chosen from the graveyard at random, Jesse can't look at. He sort of holds it up like this and then sets it face down. So he doesn't know what the card is that he sets face down. That's the whole gamble aspect and the fact that you're not allowed to check your graveyard when you use this effect. So it's actually kind of insane that the card that he actually does set down is Hand Destruction, the most perfect card to counter what Adrian is about to do. I don't want to go into the amount of luck that requires to get that card with all the other cards he's got in the graveyard, but it's the anime. Jesse follows this play by summoning his Grave Squirmer. He enters his battle phase and attacks Fog King. Fog King destroys Grave Squirmer, leaving Jesse with only 100 life points left. However, since Grave Squirmer was destroyed, it can destroy one card of the field. He destroys Royal Sword, preventing Adrian from winning on his next turn. And since it is no longer equipped with the sword, its attack returns back to zero. However, since Royal Sword was destroyed, Adrian can activate his trap, Crest Burn. Adrian can fill up his monster zones with his Fog Castle counters, equal to the number of crest counters that were on the destroyed sword. With three additional counters added onto the monster zones, this means that all of Adrian's monster zones are unplayable. Due to this, Fog King is sent to the graveyard. Jesse ends his turn. It's Adrian's turn, and the penultimate turn of the duel. He draws and gets Magical Mallet. Since all of Adrian's zones are clogged by the Fog Castle, its final effect is now activatable. By sending it and his entire hand to the graveyard, he can add four cards in his graveyard to his hand. However, he won't be allowed to attack this turn. 
And here is where it is revealed that Adrian hasn't changed his win condition. He's still going for an Exodia OTK. He discards Magical Mallet and adds back Exodia the Forbidden One, left arm of the Forbidden One, right arm of the Forbidden One, and right leg of the Forbidden One. With four pieces of Exodia in his hand, Adrian goes for game. He activates his face down Break the Seal. Its effect lets it send itself and one other Break the Seal on the field in order to add a Forbidden One card from his deck to his hand. He attempts to add the final piece, left leg of the Forbidden One. However, in response, Jesse gambles on his mysterious set card. He sends Nightmare Shuffle to the graveyard in order to be allowed to activate it. If this card is anything other than Hand Destruction, Jesse will lose the duel. However, we already know it's Hand Destruction. Since its activation timing and effect are legal, its effect resolves, forcing both players to discard four cards and draw the same amount. Adrian discards all the pieces of Exodia in his hand and draws four new cards. He gets a Feather of the Phoenix, Backup Soldier, Exploding Cloud, and Break the Seal. Since Jesse had no hand, he simply draws one new card. He gets Grinder Golem. The effect of Break the Seal resolves, and Adrian adds the left leg of the Bidden One to his hand. Unable to attack for gain due to Fog Castle's detrimental effect, he activates a Feather of the Phoenix. By discarding one card in his hand, he can place one card in his graveyard on the top of his deck. He discards Exploding Cloud and then places Exodia the Forbidden One in his grave on the top of his deck. Adrian sets Backup Soldier and ends his turn. The plan? Activate Backup Soldier. Add three Exodia pieces in his graveyard back to his hand. His turn happens, draw the final piece, win with Exodia again. So that means Ubel needs to win this turn or else he will lose. What could go wrong? It's Jesse's turn and the final turn of the duel. He draws and gets you Bell. Jesse activates the effect of Grinder Golem in his hand. By summoning two tokens to his side of the field into attack, he can special summon Grinder Golem to Adrian's side of the field. Jesse tributes the two tokens in order to tribute summon his true form, Ubel. Ubel attacks Grinder Golem, which in the anime is represented by mind controlling the opponent's monster into attacking it out of hatred. However, the attack is done in the anime by a manifestation of Echo, which represents Adrian's darkness because the whole duel, Ubel's been looking for the darkness inside of Adrian, but he's been a bit too cool, calm, and collected. Nothing seems to bother him, but it turns out that this is his darkness and she's finally drawn it out and she's glad because she can to get that full restore because that's what she's been after anyway thanks to you bell's effect it makes it so that it can't be destroyed by battle and any damage she would take is instead inflicted to the opponent with this adrian loses the door let's be honest adrian is a really underappreciated character and at the same time you sacrifice your girlfriend to get a deck and you still didn't win that's a shame. However, let's be honest, he defeated Chaz Princeton, Asta Phoenix, and made you Bell, like, really sweat throughout this duel. Like, she expected this to be a cakewalk, and she was really, really surprised. In terms of the duel, there was very little wiggle room for alternative plays outside of the ones that I mentioned. And while it's hard to defend insane luck and perfect cards to counter very specific situations for the Exodia deck, let's keep in mind that you Bell originally gave Adrian the Exodia deck, so obviously she's intimately aware of what his deck is like to a degree, and I guess that makes sense that she knew to go for this deck to counter his deck, so you can't really fault her in that way, so I guess it's fine. Overall, a fun duel, and if you'd like to watch another of you Bell's duels, well, I have a duel analysis video right here on that, or perhaps you'd like to learn more about Exodia the Forbidden One, well, I have a video about that as well. Hope you all enjoyed this video, guys. Catch you later.